Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Light of the Valley. It is the 14th Sunday after Pentecost. That's our church year that we're talking about. Uh, so it means it's been 14 Sundays since that 50 days after Easter. And what we do in church in this season of Pentecost is we spend time focusing on the life of the believer and what God's Word has to say to us, how we should live our everyday life. Uh, but today is special not only because we kind of get to the aftermath, the fallout actually, of Jesus' Bread of Life sermon and what that means, what that means for us. But today we get to celebrate Jesus as the Bread of Life coming through His Word and through His water in baptism today. Uh, we're going to have two baptisms, uh, brother, sister, here today. And that's an amazing, wonderful thing our Lord will be doing for Jaden and Declan this morning. Everything you need, pretty much, minus the hymns, are in your worship folder. We start on page 3, where it says our first hymn is hymn 401, Your Works, Not Mine, O Christ. Those hymnals you're going to find, those are the red books that are just in the racks uh, in the chair in front of you. So go ahead and pull that out and turn to hymn 401, and we'll begin our worship by singing Your Works, Not Mine, O Christ. God bless your worship here today. He clothes us with the robe of righteousness and gives us a new life. 
our sinful nature need not control us any longer. We recall what baptism means for our daily lives when we speak these words. Baptism means that the sinful nature in us should be drowned by daily sorrow and repentance, and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. As baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am my nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. I invite the choir to come forward at this time to sing, Come Holy Spirit.
first part of verse 2, and then verses 14 to 18. As we're going to hear a little bit while later, what Jesus teaches us today is often hard. Not everything is easy, easy to grasp, easy to understand, easy to believe. So often we're called to do things that aren't easy when it comes to our faith, when it comes to following Christ. You can imagine how hard it looked to the Israelites as they were about to enter that promised land. They were bigger, they were stronger, they were fortified. But using Joshua, the Israelites had come, they had conquered the land, they had the victory that God promised. Now as they finally take that promised land as their inheritance, Joshua says, who will you serve? Will you serve God? Or will you continue to go back and serve other gods? Joshua's answer is written very clearly here, recorded for us. May his answer be our answer. And Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, the Jews for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. This is the word of our Lord. Today's second Bible reading comes from Hebrews chapter 11, reading verses 24 to 28. Like Joshua and Peter, Moses knew that the most important thing in life was to serve the Lord instead of living a comfortable life. We hear, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as the greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking, up, looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the application of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand to sing the Alleluia. Do you? 
Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. I invite the children to come up for a children's message.
the name of the Son who redeemed us, in the name of the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us. Amen. A portion of God's Word that we're going to focus on this morning is from John chapter 6, verses 60 to 69. But as we have meditation on that word, let us pray. May the words of my lips and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, o Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Jesus' bread of life sermon, he was teaching in the synagogue and he was explaining, I am the bread of life. My flesh, my blood, this I give. It is real food, it is real drink. This is what you need to be filled up for eternal life. Food of this world, it perishes, it spoils, it goes away, but I last forever, so take me in. Don't think with your bellies anymore. Flesh counts for nothing. My words are spirit, and they are life. Through them, the Father will draw you to me, to eternal life with me. And Jesus finished his sermon. Generally, when we finish sermons, we say amen. We say amen out of some kind of weird way of not saying period or exclamation point. We say amen because it's a statement that means this is true. This is a certain statement. This is nothing short of the word of God explained, proclaimed to you. Now, typically... When I say amen in church, I say amen at the end of a message, end of a sermon, I haven't really heard people audibly grumbling about the message they just heard. But Jesus did. In fact, when he finished that sermon, we hear the very next, that's where our verses started out today. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? That's what Jesus' disciples said. His followers, the ones who wanted to learn from him. This is too hard. This is tough. And it's not that they didn't understand the picture. It's not that they didn't understand his words. It's just, Jesus, you said we have to consume you. We have to eat you to have eternal life. I know you've talked that, that it's about spirit and all of that. So you mean take you in. But this is hard. And each of us, we have teachings that we think are hard, things that Jesus has said that this is, this is difficult. Not that I don't understand it, but to believe it, to accept it, I don't know. And certainly you probably have your list of, of teachings from God that you're like, that's hard, that's tough, that's tough to swallow. Let's talk about what happened today. Two baptisms. You step back and think about what was happening here. And, you know, today Declan is just about like four months old, right? You guys ever seen Declan's sin? <laughs> if not, please talk to Doug and Eric. <laughs> we only get to see him an hour a week, maybe. But he's a little sinner. But he looks so cute. He looks so pure. He's in this like, cute little baptismal gown. How could he have done anything wrong? But yet he's selfish. He cares nothing about your sleep schedule. He cares nothing about the fact that Doug and Erica have to get up in the morning and work. No. Feed me. Change me. Take care of me, rock me, burp me, hold me in this certain special way so that I can be comfortable. And I don't care what else you have going on. I don't care whatever other emergencies you have. You are going to take care of me right now. And I am going to scream at the top of my lungs until you do it. <laughs> Think if any of us did that as an adult. Would that pass for acceptable behavior? No. Declan is self-centered, and we expect that out of a baby. But that doesn't mean it's okay. That doesn't mean it's not still sin, that it's not still selfishness. 
And on top of that, I'm sorry, Doug and Eric, I love you guys both, but you're both sinners. You both have done things wrong, and so sorry you didn't create a perfect child. He came with sin. So why do you love him? Why do we love our children? We love them just because they're cute in some way that earned love from us. Because I know there's not a whole lot Declan has done for his mom and dad. I don't think he's really done anything for his mom and dad. He hasn't washed Doug's car, or he hasn't washed Erica's car. He hasn't made supper for Doug. Maybe one day. Jaden, Jaden's done good stuff, right, Jaden? Yeah. Oh, we got reasons to love Jaden. Yet, although Declan has not done anything to earn Doug and Erica's love, to earn his place in their family, they have chosen to love Declan. Chosen to love Declan from the moment his life began. And they continue to choose, De to, choose to love Declan Every time they have to get up at 2 in the morning to change a diaper, to feed him, to rock him, to take care of him. Every time he cries at the top of his lungs, Doug and Erica say, but we're going to love you, we're going to serve you, we're going to do everything for you, because we've chosen to do so. I would love to say parents inherently love their children, yet you watch the news, you know that that's not always true. There are some parents who hate their children, who literally throw their children away. Love is not so much a feeling as it is a choice, it is an action. It's an action that you see most often parent to child. It's an action we see because we learned it from the one who made us. We learned it from God himself. Today, that love was on full display. A choice of what God was doing with this, this simple water, with simple words, to do something absolutely amazing. You see, God chose to love Declan. God chose to love Jaden. And God chose to love Doug and Erica. In fact, he probably had that in his mind as he was preaching this sermon, as he was telling these people, consume me, I am the bread of life, I give my flesh, I give my blood for you, so that you can live forever, so that you can be drawn to me for forever. And he wasn't talking about the Lord's Supper, that came later, he was talking about the fact that he's giving his life every piece of it, every moment of every day, and he had in mind before he was even a thought, before he was ever conceived, before his life began, God had in mind Declan, and Jane, and Doug, uh, and Erica, all of you, and me. And when the people started grumbling about this hard teaching, It'd be so easy to say, well, you don't like it, guess what? You could just go to hell. No, he didn't lash out. He didn't berate them. He let them leave. He tried to call them back one more time. Is this too hard to accept? Does this offend you that I gave you something so hard? That I said it's all going to be about me? What if you saw me go back up into heaven? I came down from heaven. I can go back. I will go back. No one comes to the Father unless the Father draws them to me. So Jesus didn't lash out that day. He didn't give in to his anger. In fact, he did that every single day of his life living perfectly, never thinking a wrong thought, never mistaking 
something, never disobeying, never insulting someone, never hurting anyone. He is perfect, which makes sense. He's God. He's God, no beginning, no end. God from all eternity. God who came down from heaven, clothed himself with human flesh so that he could take our place. And so every second he was thinking of you, of I'm doing this for you, that when people grumbled against him, no, nope, I'm going to continue preaching, teaching, doing miracles for you. That when people insulted him, mocked him, spit on him, struck him, nailed him to a cross, he did not whisk them away. He did not scream at them. He kept going. He continued, and he stayed on that cross, even as people taunted him, hey, if you really are the Son of God, come on down, prove yourself. But he wasn't going to come down, because he was thinking of you, because he was thinking of Jacob, of Jaden, Doug, Eric, all of us. He stayed there, endured the shame of the cross, endured the pain, endured the death, because by it, he was carrying on his shoulders everything we have ever done wrong. Every sin, every impure thought, every action we did wrong, he bore it, and he paid for it. That's love. To willingly choose to take on sin that's not his. To do something, to suffer something he should never suffer for, where he did that for you, did that for me. By that cross, he paid for that sin. He chose to stay there, chose to go there, because he wanted to take our sin away. After he rose from the dead, showing the fact that his payment was received by the Father, that your sins truly have been paid for, he announced to his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Here he has given his flesh. He has given his blood. It has taken away our sins. It has given us eternal life. And now he gives us this gift of baptism, this washing of water with the word of God that takes away our sins. Now, Jaden, with Jaden, it's a little easier. Jaden, you can talk to. Jaden, you can have a conversation with. Jaden, you can ask questions. And she knows. She knows God has washed away my sins here today. I asked Declan if he's asleep right now. I asked Declan I'm not getting an answer. Not just because he's asleep, because he can't communicate that. But he needs a Savior in the same way every single one of us need a Savior. Because every one of us are, are conceived in sin. We bring in imperfection into this world. We need someone to save us from that. So today, we know with absolute certainty, God reached out with water and his word, Declan has been washed clean of all of his sins. That with water and the word Declan, and that's part of the symbolism, it looks really cute, but that's why he's wearing this all nice white little outfit today. It's a symbol of what God has done for him. He has stood in our place. He has paid for our sins. And in baptism, he clothes us with his perfection. So when God looks at us, he sees nothing but perfection. He sees what his son has done. Sees no more sin. No more imperfection. A gift that lasts for a lifetime. A gift that fills us up to eternal life. It's not Jane who did work today. It's not Declan who did work today. It's not Doug and Erica who did work today. It's not me who did work today. It was all God. Everything that God did is what happened here today. It's 
what happened in baptism, what happens through his word. You have nothing that you contribute to being made perfect in God's sight. Does that, that trouble you? Is that hard? Is that tough to swallow? Is that like, like really stale old bread that you try to chew on and you feel like you're going to break your teeth kind of hard? Because we like to take the wheel. We like to say, hey, I do this thing for God, or I'm not as bad as that person, or I haven't done so as many consciously bad things that I should be acceptable to God. He says it's not how it works. It's not about just being better than somebody else. It's not about doing less wrong. It's about perfection, nothing short of perfection. It's a task that none of us can do. We're all doomed to fail. So we needed someone to step into our place. We needed someone to be the perfection that we could not be. We needed Jesus. We needed the very one who calls himself the bread of life. The bread come down from heaven because no one else could give their flesh, their blood, and make any difference. The people were thinking with their bellies. They were thinking with their flesh. They were thinking, I could do these things and then I could be a little better before God. But Jesus says, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. So take me in. Take in everything I have done, and you can know that you are covered with my perfection. You can know that your sins are paid for. You can know that you stand worthy and perfect before God right now. That was Jesus' message. And then he heard the grumbling. This is tough. This is tough to swallow. Who can accept this? And sadly... We hear from this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. It was too tough. Too tough, it doesn't make sense. Too tough, I can't believe it. Too tough, I have to contribute something. Too tough, it can't all be done for me. This is too hard to swallow. And many left. I preach to you hard things. Not so much that they're hard to understand, but hard to step back and say, I don't contribute to it. I don't make myself perfect. I don't earn it. I can't live up to it. To say it's all done, that's hard. To say that there's nothing else I need to do, that's hard. That's why Jesus says, only those that my Father draws to me will come to me. And then many people leave. I haven't had it happen truly yet when I've said an amen at the end of the sermon and people have walked out. You can prove me wrong today. Give me a story to tell. Maybe you're all just too polite and you'll wait. Wait till you get in your cars. Talk about that stupid Lutheran preacher. What does he know? He can't get it right. Who's he? I preached to you now my message. Not my thoughts, not what I think is right. I preached to you the bread of life. Jesus Christ, one who gave his flesh and his blood to take away your sins and to clothe you with perfection. And so the question comes to you. You're not answerable to me, you're answerable to God. Do you want to leave? Just like he asked the twelve. Is this too hard? Is this too hard to swallow? 
Peter gave an answer for the whole group. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus, we can't get this message anywhere else. Jesus, there's no one else who can be the perfection that God requires. Jesus, you are the only one who can give us eternal life. Nowhere else can we get this. Everyone else will tell us that we have to earn it. Everyone else will tell us we've got to do something to make ourselves more acceptable, something to get to their version of what's the better hereafter. But instead, Jesus, you tell us it's all you. That we take you in. You fill us up to eternal life. You cover us with perfection. So, Lord, it's hard. <laughs> it's difficult to say, I don't have a part in this. I don't have control over this. But only you have the words of eternal life. Only you are the one who can build me up, clothe me with perfection, give me eternal life to live with you forever. So yeah, that's hard. He just didn't say it was going to be easy. In fact, he said there's going to be a lot of hard things. So today, Lord, we ask this through your word, you would draw us to you. That you would give to us that true bread of life once again. That as you have filled up Jane and Declan today through baptism, that we would remember our baptism. The way that you clothed us with perfection, and with them, we would know that we are going to live with you forever. Lord, keep me coming back to you and to your word, because you are the only one who has the words of eternal life. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue our worship with our confession of faith from the Apostles' Creed. That's at the top of page 8 in our worship folder. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, for the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. One note as we uh, collect, uh, gather, or continue our worship by gathering our offerings is uh, if this is your first time at Light of the Valley, or if you would like me to contact you sometime during this next week, we ask you to fill out the little contact cards. You'll find them every second and fourth uh, chair, just in the rack there. You put your name and whatever contact information you would want to use. You can place that in the offering plate as it comes around, or you can hand it to me at the end of service today. So with that, let's continue our worship by gathering our gifts and offerings to our bread of life King, Jesus.
Please stand for prayer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship and praise you, the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Establish our hearts firmly in your word that we may trust all that you promise and obey all that you command, even when it's hard to accept. Move us daily to repent of our sins and to trust in your mercy, which has forgiven all our sins and made us pure and holy in your sight. Keep us as your heirs of everlasting life. Keep us faithful to your word, giving us grace to believe every word, confess faithfully and truthfully every teaching, obey every command, and heed every encouragement. Make us ready at all times to defend the truth and to give answer to all who ask us about the sure and certain hope we have in Christ. Through your word, be our guide and our constant companion, that we might be led to shun all that is sinful and choose those things that are appropriate for our calling as your dear children. Keep our faith from failing, O Lord. In times of trouble, teach us to look to you as our helper. In times of sorrow, teach us to look to you as our comforter. In times of need, teach us to look to you as our benefactor. Thank you for all the blessings you so bountifully bestow upon our bodies and spirits. May we serve you with the best of our gifts and abilities. Make us ready to do every good work. Continue to gather the members of this congregation regularly, that we may worship you and hear your word. Draw us near through the precious good news of Jesus Christ as our perfect substitute. Increase the bond of Christian love among us at, through your word. Remind us to pray for one another. Make us willing to share one another's burdens. Preserve us from being fatigued and overcome by the affairs of this life, that we fail to give adequate time and attention to your word. Help us to grow to full Christian maturity through, through the spirit, the spiritual food that you set before us in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. Lord, also today, we ask for your continued presence and healing hand upon the people that we know, the people that we love. From Loretta Hildebrand, the sister of Mary Moore, now that she's returned to Wyoming, we ask that you continue to heal her and restore her health. For Karen Curtis, our sister in Christ, that as she's been in the hospital for the last two days, we thank you for the healing that you have given her and ask that everything goes well, that she can come home today. For our sister in Christ, June Hamlin, that as she continues to have pain in her body, we ask that you would relieve that and take that away and to give her strength to serve you each and every day as a gift of your grace. And now, Lord, we ask you to hear us as we bring you our private petition. All these things, where else that you see that we need, grant us, O oh Lord, through Jesus Christ, our God and Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.
stay seated. Well, thank you for coming out here this morning, joining us for worship. Uh, very blessed privilege to get to see the miracle of baptism today that Jane and Dan would both wash clean of all their sins. If there's any ever doubt today we're part of the family of God, you know for certain after today they are. Uh, that was a wonderful thing. So we're going to celebrate that. Uh, so there are, there's food, there's cake, there's all sorts of goodies over in the fellowship hall. Um, anybody, there are any announcements about that before I send people that way? Okay, you guys can just, after service, you can go that way and go enjoy, um, enjoy the food, enjoy the fellowship. Uh, do note we have a lot of things going on coming up here. Next Sunday is uh, Labor Day weekend, and so in September we really kind of kick everything back off. So September 9th, we'll have a special kickoff potluck Sunday. Uh, bring a dish to pass as we get ready. Um, we'll have a Bible study for adults, teens, and kids. Uh, that's going to all be starting again on the 9th. So we'll take off for the Bible study next Sunday, but we'll still have worship at our normal time. You see catechism starting, choir, um, all of this coming up. Still one more day for photo updates for your picture if you haven't taken that yet. Um, and let's see all the, the work days we have planned coming up here in September as we're trying to finish off our remodeling project. And then one last one. Uh, notice that there's a uh, we're looking at the possibility of offering a Monday night worship service. If that is something that appeals to you, something you would make use of, please jump onto our website and fill out the survey that's there. Um, because I'm gathering right now just the interest, because the interest isn't there, I'm not going to do that. But if that is something you need to utilize, and I realize I'm speaking to a Sunday morning crowd, that you're able to be here on Sunday mornings, but if you know someone who can't, and uh, maybe they work Sunday mornings, uh, whatever it is, have them check that out, fill that out, so that uh, we can uh, make plans accordingly. So with that, say hello to the people you come to worship today. Maybe somebody you haven't said hello to yet, and I'll get to the back, uh, shake your hand, and wish you God's blessings on your day.